Okay, so what I want to do real quick is a quick video on proofs. And it's not going to be anything in depth as in going step by step through a proof, but it's more conveying the information of what proofs are and why we actually use them versus the actual arduous process of going through a proof, just because that gets into a little bit more tedious nonsense. I don't want to say nonsense, but it's just a little bit too much information that we don't really currently need. But the actual importance of proofs is a more actual takeaway here. So it's going to be a two part video. There's going to be another one that's going to go over various types of proof right after this. But for this, it's just kind of like an introduction to them. So let's get going into it. All right. Like I said, just an introduction to proof, just very quick. So before we get into what proofs are and how to actually do them, we need to discuss the concept of definitions. Now, a lot of definitions we're going to go over in this are going to be very, very basic, but they exist as a basis to what we can do later. We need to have some actual foundation and grounding to base our proofs on before we can actually start doing anything. So many mathematical theorems around any proof utilize a lot of standard algebra. So you're going to see a good bit of algebra being used in proofs to kind of boil things down and adjust them to try and help get from point A to point B, which is basically your hypothesis to your conclusion. Now, we can do the same thing with discrete logic, utilizing the various operations like AND, OR, ZOR, conditional statements, stuff like that, and our two quantifiers are the universal and existential quantifiers. So, for one definition, or well, technically two here, we have the even and odd integers. Now, even integer is essentially anything that can be put into the form of x equals 2k where k is an integer. So if we take an example of say 4 equals 2k, well we can set k to 2. Adds up, therefore 4 is an even integer based on an actual mathematical definition. There is no actual question on this, this is the actual genuine definition of what an even integer is. Another example, and this one's why actually more commonly debated if you don't actually know the definition, will be zero. Well, we can plug in zero right here, and based on actual definition, zero is an even integer. Now, moving on to odd, it's very, very similar, but instead of having two times k, we have two times k plus one. So let's add a plus one here. Now we're trying to plug in four. Well, there's nothing we can do. If we plug in one, we end up with three, if we plug in with 2, we get 5. Now, this does mean that both 3 and 5 are odd, but it dictates that 4 is not odd because it would break the actual definition. And then we have the idea of parity down here, which is two integers regarding their stance is even or odd, so like polarity. So identical polarity is going to be the same parity, and different polarity will be opposite parity. So we have two even numbers, they're going to have identical polarity, so they're going to be both even, so the parity is the same, and then the parity parity is going to be if it's like 3 and 5. Now, we also have a definition for what rational numbers are, and I'm going to have a few examples of formal and informal definitions. So the formal definition of rational number is there exist integers x and y such that y is not equal to 0, and r equals x over y. So let's take a real quick. So we want r equal to, I don't know, 5 over 4, right? So we have two integers, 5 and 4. y is not equal to 0, because if we had y equals 0, we'd get division by 0, and uh, that would get bad real fast. So it goes to the actual nuance of saying, yes, we need integers. They need to be in the form of r equals x over y. And then you also need to specify that y is not equal to 0. Informal, you can turn r into a fraction using x over y. Not a big deal. So, for particular rational numbers though, the choice of x and y is not necessarily unique. So we have r equals 0 0.5, for example, we can turn that into 1 over 2, or you can change that into 2 over 4. It's the same value, but they end up being two different fractions in their form. So that's perfectly fine. Now division. This is going to be brought up as kind of a precursor to another definition. So there's only the formal, so it's a lot of parts. An integer x divides an integer y if and only if x is not equal to 0 
and y equals kx for some integer k. The fact that x divides y is done by x bar y. If x does not divide y, this is denoted by x bar like slash through it y. If x divides y, then y is set to be a multiple of x, and x is a factor or divisor of y. So just based on this definition, we have see y equals kx. X cannot be zero. Uh, so let's just do four. So four times some number, let's say two, would give us eight. Therefore, x, which is four, divides eight. Now, with the definition of division, we can come up with the definitions of prime and composite numbers. So we have formal and an informal version here. So formal says an integer n is prime if and only if n is greater than one, and for every positive integer m, if m divides n, then m equals one or m equals n. So there's a lot of jargon. Informal is an integer is prime if its only factors are one in itself. So basically, if we had say three, it's only gonna be divisible by three and one, nothing else. Also, it does have to be greater than one, so it has to be, one is not gonna be prime, zero is not prime, so on and so forth. Now, composite is basically any number that's not prime, and we can determine that because, again, definition, if and only if, and it's greater than one, there's an integer m such that one is less than m, m is less than n, and m divides n. And what that is saying is an integer composite if it has factors aside from one in itself. So, again, we have pretty jargony uh, definitions here, but those definitions are jargony for the specific reason of it needs to catch all possibilities and edge cases and have very, very specific wording to be used as such a low level basis because we build upon that because we use division as a basis to become the prime and composite definitions we can use those definitions as basis for our actual proofs later on. And then same thing kind of here in inequalities is since we have all of these different definitions we can use logical equivalency to rearrange how things are set. So for less than greater than equal than we have a few different ways of saying it so example be x is greater than 5 is true is the same as saying x is less than equal to five is false. Same thing here, nine is equal to nine, uh, y is equal to nine, or y is less than nine is true. The whole thing gives birth to this new symbol of less than or equal to as a single operation. And then z equals six, or z is greater than nine, gives us z is less than six is false. We can determine this based on this definition. So, theorem is a statement that can be proven to be true. Every positive integer is less than or equal to its square. Now, let's say about positive integer. Uh, let's, do, let's do six. So we're saying that six is less than or equal to six squared. That would be six is less than 36. That's true. So we're doing positive integers. So let's do the lowest one. One is less than or equal to one squared, which is true. So this theorem, by the process of just kind of uh, hard putting in values, ends up being true. So we have a true theorem, but we also have the idea of axioms. An axiom is a statement that is assumed to be true. A very, very common example of this is gravity. It is the theory of gravity, because we assume that, specifically on Earth, we have negative 9.8 meters per second squared. That is the pull of gravity towards the center of Earth, and we have that number, that finite number, because we've never had an instance in physics where it was didn't hold up, was false. It's always been true. We have failed to disprove it. So at this point, we just assume it to be true because it's consistently always been true. We've never actually proven it 100% true, but it's been done over the course of time so many times that we just basically take it at face value. Now, at any point, we could disprove it, and then everything would be kind of thrown out the window. We have to kind of restructure everything that it's based on, and that happens sometimes. 
Um, it's never a good thing that happens because a lot of the stuff that we assume to be true ends up being false and you kind of have to rethink the entire process. So axioms are, depending on the context and situation, perfectly fine to use as a basis for proofs. Just be careful. That's, that's all I'll say if you ever do anything with proofs and anything in research, just, just be careful. So proof also consists of a series of steps, each of which follows logically from assumptions or from previously proven statements, whose final step should result in the statement of the theorem being proven. So in our series of steps that we did up here, we had one is less than or equal to one squared, we just plug in some values, test it over and over. Obviously this is very rudimentary, we just plugged in some values and got to the lowest value, and that means it's always gonna be true now we are using some, again, assumptions here on that aspect, but we could actually go further and prove it for every single value using universal quantifiers. There's no need to in this case because of how simplistic it is. Or in the assumptions, we can also use an axiom where we assume it to be true because it's just never been proven false. So it's just different ways to have the basis of your proof, but regardless, it's going to be some series of steps that is founded on these principles to get to a true statement. And then we have universal and existential theorems. So universal we have the sum of two positive real numbers, right here, sum of those, is strictly greater than the average of the two numbers. So we have universal x, universal y, so we have some nested quantifiers, x is greater than zero, and y is greater than zero implies that x plus y is greater than x plus y over two. And we can go through the whole process of doing this, but if we just take a look at it, let's say the two, sum of two positive real numbers. Uh, let's just do four and, um, let's do four and nine. Yeah, so four plus nine is 13, and the average of this would be, well, four plus nine divided by two, which is gonna be 13 divided by two, which since we're dealing with just, it's not integers, 6.5. And that's always been true because no matter what you divide, you're always gonna have a less than value since we are dealing strictly with integers, but well, since we're still strictly dealing with non-integers, we can end up with floating point because the lowest values that we can get for positive numbers, let's change up this a little bit to one and one, which gives me two. One, one, well, actually, no, this, even if it was integers, still adds up. End up with one plus one divided by two is going to be one. So that ends up adding up no matter what. So that's good. But realistically, you'd have to go through this whole arduous process of proving the universal quantifier. We're not going to do that. You would use the one plus one as the arbitrary element here and it'd be fine. Now, existential, there's an integer that is equal to its square. So x equals x, x equals x squared. Well, we can just do one equals one squared, and that's true, so there does exist some integer that is equal to its square, so it's true. That's pretty much all there is. Obviously, these are very simplistic examples, but it still gets the actual point across. Now, a very specific type of proof is going to be proof by exhaustion. So if the domain of a universal statement is small, it may be easiest to just prove it by checking each element individually, kind of like what we've been doing in the previous ones, but I've been mostly creating maybe some uh, subsets from these larger sets, like all positive integers, all real numbers, so on and so forth, just because it's enough to kind of get the point across and it has some consistent pattern to it. Whereas in this case, we have the theorem if n is an element of negative one, zero, and one, then n squared is equal to the absolute value of n. So what they're gonna do is check the equality for each possible value of n, and we have three different instances that we're going to exhaust. So n equals negative one, ends up being negative one squared equals one, equals the absolute value of negative one, that checks out, n equals zero, zero squared equals zero, equals the absolute value of zero, that checks out, and then n equals one, one squared equals one, equals the absolute value of one, that checks out, and this denotes the end of the proof. So yeah, proof by exhaustion here, we have three cases. Just solve all of them, they end up all being true, so the entire thing is true. 
Not too bad. Uh, yeah, okay. I thought I skipped something. So universal generalization. If the domain of a universal statement is a large or even infinite set, it becomes very impractical or even possibly infeasible slash impossible to prove a statement individually for each element of the domain. Just because, well, if it's infinite, you definitely are not going to be able to go through it one by one. You cannot use proof by exhaustion. So what you do is you name some arbitrary element inside the domain. Typically, if it's for a universal statement, you want to assume that this arbitrary object is going to be true at all times, and then use that. And if you can prove that instance true, and since that instance is always true, that means that the entire statement will be true. So their theorem is every positive integer is less than or equal to its square. So they're going to do what x be an integer such that x is greater than zero, and then they'd have steps showing that x is less than or equal to x squared. And the arbitrary element I would probably use is just one is less than or equal to one squared, and it's the lowest element you can have as an integer to be, you know, <laughs> applicable here, so there's no real way to go around that. So yeah, I mean, you just use this as your arbitrary element, it's always going to be true, and it's the lowest one, so it kind of just solves everything for you. Now, obviously there would be some more in-depth steps that might be taken, but sometimes it's just these are very simple examples, so there's not going to be a whole lot of steps in general. So let's move on. So, as opposed to arbitrary elements to prove things true, we have counterexamples to prove things false. So a counterexample is assigning the values to variables that shows that a universal statement is false, because we just need one instance of it. When it comes to larger infinite domains, it's usually easiest to assume an arbitrary example that can disprove the statement. So instead of trying to prove the entire thing true, you just try and find one thing that's false, because usually that's just the easiest approach. Conversely, it's very easy to prove existential statements true because you just need one to be true, but then you have the aspect of trying to disprove an existential statement, which is much more difficult. In terms of proving universal true, proving universal false, proving existential true, proving existential false, you would think and technically be right in assuming that proving a universal true is equally as difficult to proving an existential false. Logically, that's sound because it takes the same amount of effort, but for us as humans, we really like to look to try and prove things true. It is just in our nature Whereas trying to prove things false is a much more difficult concept. Disproving things is usually not the goal. That's usually a result or kind of a competition of trying to prove something true. If somebody's trying to prove something true, someone else might try and prove it false, but that typically doesn't end up being what we always try to do initially. We try and seek truth. It's just kind of a nature. It's just over the course of generations, just something we do. So the concept of disproving everything, so we're in existential, you have to prove every single instance false, doesn't come naturally. So what we do is we can utilize the Morgan's Law to change proving an existential statement false to proving a universal statement true, which for us is far easier. Now, an example of that would be there is a real number whose square is negative. Well, we can't really do anything with this. You know, you don't have anything to get a square to be negative. I mean, I don't where you can start, you have real numbers, so obviously let's just choose a five. Is, is there ever gonna be an instance where we do five squared or any, any value squared? That'll give us a negative value. No, we don't have any definition or basis or anything to go off of. We just have the operation of powers of two and real numbers. That's it. Now, 
if we use the Morgan's Law to kind of flip things around, we end up with the result of the square of every real number. So instead of saying there is a real number, we get the square of every real number is greater than or equal to zero, positive, or well, non-negative versus negative. And now this becomes far more feasible. So the square of every real number, let's just do, uh, I don't know. Let's just do the lowest ones. Let's do one. One squared equals one. That is greater than equal to zero. Negative one squared equals one. It's also greater than equal to zero. And finally, zero squared equals zero, which is also greater than equal to zero. And since we used the Morgan's Law to create this new proof, the result of it must also be consistent with its logical equivalency, which is going to be our original statement. So, since we got this one true, Morgan's Law says that this one must be false. So, that's all there is really for this introduction to proofs. In the next video, I'm going to be going over various different types of proofs that can kind of come about very similar to changing from universal to existential. If we take the approach of what we're trying to prove true and kind of rethink our way of what we're saying or rethink the approach of what we're doing, you can end up with some really interesting circumstances and just new methodology of actually trying to prove something. Much easier methods as opposed to just start the hypothesis, go through some steps, and get to a conclusion because it's not always going to be that straightforward. So that's what the next video is going to be about for this one. Just in basic introduction to proofs, nothing really fancy, nothing going on, super crazy. So regardless, hope you learned something, and I'll see you in the next one.